All right. So I hope you found this exercise online. It should be posted, or it is posted there. Um, and uh, and still, I do want to go over it because this should help when you try to conceptualize what in the world is going on in Grimm's Law. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, Werner's Law is a little bit more complicated, so we'll do these two exercises today, and, uh, and that way we're, we're practicing for um, the uh, test, your first test that is going to be posted on Friday, and you can do that test any time on Friday. You have two hours to do it, but you can choose your two hours, whatever feels best for you when you have a quiet house or a quiet place or when you have had your caffeine fix and when you are most alert and so on. It is open book, open note because there's no way I'm not going to pretend that I am requiring a, a, a test. It's more like it's more like a review exercise, but you get the points for it's 20% of your grade. It's mostly multiple choice. Uh, I haven't really posted it yet, but uh, but we, we cover chapters one through five, um, five included, and um, and then all the postings on Blackboard, uh, all the uh, exercises I've asked you to do, or all the exercises that are in the book. You kind of like by definition will do that. Those you can check them at the end of the book. There there is the answer key, and so. Um, all the lecture notes and so on. Do you have any questions about that? No? Okay, yeah. It should be relatively straightforward. Um, so we, let's, uh, yes. Uh, is it gonna be entirely online or are you gonna ask us to like print it out and then turn the answers back in somehow? I'm, I'm gonna make it entirely online. So it's gonna, it's gonna be on Blackboard and it's mostly multiple choice, so you just you know click, you select the the answer. Uh, in in my multiple choice t uh, tests, there is always only one best answer, but the best answer may be all the above, none of the above, A and B, neither A nor B, or something. So read all the possibilities very carefully. Multiple choice questions take a lot of patience because you have to, you can't just rush, oh, that looks right, because there may be another um, other answer which is more right. <laughs> so, okay. Did that answer? Yes. Your question. Okay. So, let's uh, apply Grimm's Law because this is the best thing we can, we can read about Grimm's Law and it makes perfect sense. Uh, let's review it quickly here. So uh, these are Indo-European sounds. You remember last time we covered the sounds of Indo-European, the kinds of consonant sounds it had. Now uh, Grimm's law affected uh, the um, the stop consonants in Indo-European, and S also. We added that briefly. That had to do with uh, Werner's law. But uh, what happened to, uh, okay, and Grimm's law applies only to one of the Indo-European branches. And what is that one branch, that Grimm's law? Germanic. Very Germanic, exactly. And the reason why we are talking about Grimm's law here is because English is a Germanic, Germanic language. language. English is a West Germanic language. Uh, but it is a Germanic language. So we can see these uh, effects of the Grimm's Law in how the English words, their, their shape, uh, the phonological shape of English words today. When you compare English words to other uh, non-Germanic Indo-European languages, you see this, these consistent similarities and differences. So cognate words, very often they show um, this, this, so you've got pater in uh, Romance languages, in Italic languages, and you've got father in 
in uh, English, in German, which is in other Germanic languages. You have far there, even though it's written with a V, it's pronounced as an F, far there for, for uh, father. Um, far in uh, Swedish, in other Scandinavian languages. So you have an F in uh, Germanic when uh, non-Germanic uh, Indo-European languages have a P. And uh, this is the list of the correspondences. So uh, in Germanic, B became, T became, the data and k became huh. exactly so now uh, from Indo-European these we can simplify and say they were lost uh, of course that was a process that was a very gradual process took centuries and millennia even but uh, but they eventually they were lost not millennia centuries in Germany but they uh, they, they were no longer there in Germanic. If I said Indo-European, erase that. So in Germanic, uh, these kind of left empty spaces. So what happened next? B, D, and G became... P, T, P, T. Exactly. P, T, and K. So they, in a sense, took their place. And the next chain reaction then, because Indo-European had the set of uh, has the had the set of uh, aspirated stops, uh, b aspirated voiced stops, b, d, h, and k. So now we can kind of say that these had become different sounds. So what happened to b, d, h, and k? Yeah, they became b, d, and g. And I posted stuff on uh, on PowerPoints. It was a long PowerPoint where I showed that there were the intermediate steps here. This is a sim simplification, but it's a good uh, simplification uh, at the undergraduate level. So if you continue and uh, want to do a PhD in historical linguistics, you see that there were a lot of intermediate steps. But, but this, is, uh, this is, I would say, very much good enough and, uh, because it captures the essence of this uh, change uh, of Grimm's law. So uh, yeah, these basically took the place of these, which had become uh, which had already taken the place of the p that had changed into f f Okay. <laughs> so uh, these never, uh, in Germanic, they were lost. So uh, basically the voiced aspirated stops. They lost their aspiration in Germanic. So we don't have the h, the h, the h in the Germanic languages. So let's practice this. And, uh, and this particular exercise, it gives the Indo-European root and then asks you to provide the present day English reflex. That's a term that is used in historical linguistics of you know, the development, how did that word came, uh, come out uh, from the earlier form. Now these are Indo-European roots, uh, they are reconstructions and uh, reconstructed roots and this little asterisk indicates that they are reconstructed. Of course Indo-European doesn't have any, you know, there are no, uh, no uh, written texts or anything uh, available, not even from Germanic, which is a much later branch of uh, Indo-European, but uh, Gothic uh, is uh, the first uh, Germanic language where we have actually uh, texts available, uh, surviving texts. 
Okay, so when we look at the Indo-European route and how it developed uh, according to Grimm's law, we, we can leave our cheat sheet there. Uh, but uh, when, we, when we look at these routes, what we are going to be looking at is these Indo-European uh, Indo original sounds and uh, see how they changed. Now, all these changes were extremely regular. So uh, Grimm's law, it, it was really nice <laughs> because it, it really, it's, it's like this, you know, like a computer program. Whenever you have a pöhtekö, it becomes a and so on, uh, except for Werner's law. <laughs> so that's the exception, but we'll look at that in the next exercise. So when we look at these, we need to look at the consonants uh, and how those consonants changed um, uh, er didn't really change. Uh, consonants, consonants changed according to Grimm's law mechanically in this exercise. All the, the examples are, you know, applying Grimm's law mechanically. Uh, but uh, vowels can go anyway. Vowels are very volatile in all languages. They can change. They're much, much more subject to change. So you won't probably find in the present day English reflex the Indo-European vowels because the vowel system has gone through multiple different changes, um, even as recently as Today it's still changing, keeps changing. You can hear that people pronounce, young people may pronounce certain vowels differently from middle-aged people and so on. So let's see, what did the b become? Mm -hmm. And what happened to er? Keep the same. Keep the same. And then what happened to g? So uh, what you have in that, uh, I didn't write these here because you've got it on that, uh, on that handout uh, and the posted exercise. So hreg in Indo-European was the root that meant break. So what came out in, in English? Break. What's the word? Break. break. Yes. That's the, the, you know, the meaning has uh, stayed the, uh, the same. If you think about the fact that at 6,000 years are between the Indo-European roots and we can today, in present day English, we can figure out what these words mean. It's amazing. The meanings, some meanings, and we'll see, they have shifted a little bit. In the case of break, there, the, there is no change. Okay, so constraint is the se second uh, word uh, that uh, the Indo-European root for it was dom or domo. And uh, what happened to d? What did it become? T. Yes, thank you. And what about m? Mm, did it change the nasal? No, it stayed the same. And uh, constraint, what do you think? What do you think the meaning is? What is the word today? With these clues. Tame. Tame, yeah. Constrain, like domestic animal is a tame animal, right? So uh, domestic, of course, being a uh, borrowing from uh, much later time, but tame is the uh, the English old English term, and uh, we see the regular change of d into t here. Here we had t into b. Okay, so the next one means bite, and the root was ed. So we don't know what happened to the vowel, but we do know that d became t. So what's the word? Eat. Eat. Is yes. It, would that be one of the reasons why some speakers in the UK say uh, I ate? It, it yeah. uh, would be, uh, it wouldn't go all the way back to uh, Indo-European because vowels really are not really good indications of, of 
that long a stretch of history. But it's a British, uh, poss possibly a British pronunciation. Eight, we say always in America, uh, it. That's how I actually learned to say that when I was studying, studying English in junior high, and that it was pronounced et. And then I went to America, and I'm like, oh, people don't say et. Uh, it sounds even like a little bit non-standard here, doesn't it? So eight, uh, et or eight. But it, but, but it is true that the, that pronunciation reflects more being kind of European. So eight has changed more. Okay, the next one is give birth or family, gena, and uh, here we are looking at g. What did g become? And what about n? Stayed the same, so we've got k and n. We don't know what happened to the vowels, so what is that word? Kin. Kin. Yes, kin. Next one is guo, meaning capital, and we have to see what happened to g. K. Yes, and what's the word? K. K. Yes. Um, sometimes, you know, we don't know what happens to the glides. In this case, the glide has remained, but then there was this, you know, shuffling the meta metas metas meta metastasis. 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 Yes. metastasis, like, you know, you ch two consonants change their place. Okay, so Kel is the next one, and we're looking at what happened to K. Uh. And O is not a stop consonant, so it pretty much remained the same. And uh, this is an interesting word because it has a lot of possible reflexes. Um, anything you would like to suggest? Uh, or, 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 like, hide. I, th I could hide, but that doesn't have the L in it. Yeah. So. Okay, so the meaning is cover or conceal. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the reflexes is helmet. Mm -hmm. But it's not oh. the only one. You also find hell, or hell. because hell is in the mythology a place we know which is covered by a, by a roof or what have you. And hall, which is covered, it's uh -huh. covered place. Hall, um, hull, like in ships, right? Hold. Oh, like a stronghold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah, so the, the shelter kind yeah. of place, yes. Hollow and holster. <laughs> so you can see how these all uh, vaguely or more, more or less vaguely or more or less closely, they um, have this meaning of cover or conceal going back all the way to the Indo-European hell. So that had a lot of reflexes. Okay. So does that mean that uh, all of those words were used with the same Indo-European word, or they have different words for those, uh, like modern English words? Like on the, uh, when they said, like, hell in, well, in, uh, in uh, in the European, did they mean all of these and just have to know the context? No, they uh, for Indo-European it meant uh, cover or conceal. Yeah, that's all it meant. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, the meanings have changed over the millennia, so, so we have kind of like added these new meanings. Yeah. So, so for these reflexes, did Indo-European have specific words for those? 
that, that in present day English are now lumped with the vague meaning of so that there has been, in present-day English, there has been like this proliferation of different meanings drawing from that same, same root. And uh, we don't know, because we don't have any you know, indication, but uh, most likely it was, it, there, can, there may have been a situation where it was like a very polysemous, like a, a several different meanings for the Kel root. Mm -hmm. So it could have covered, obviously, oh. It, it could have covered all of these, uh, all of these meanings or some of them. Uh, very vague answer because we don't know. Yes. <laughs> so let's move here, and the next one is the same kind of a thing. Oh, did we skip curd? Yeah, we did. Oh, yeah, we did it. We already got to. We yeah, did it earlier. Nice Yeah, we did it last time. So what did that become? Part. Part. In present day English? Part. Part. And it's because k became h and d became t. So, and er remained the same and vowels go every which way they want. So, ger became Heart in in Germanic. In German, anyone? What is heart in German? Herz. Her, herz. Yes. Ha. It's got the same uh, ha there for the Indo-European. But then, of course, German has gone through other kinds of sound changes. All right. Uh, quell is similar to kill. It has a lot of present-day English reflexes. Um, it means revolve, and here we have the qua that uh, we don't have in that list, but you get that kind of like uh, the labial um, sound there, but it became wheel. Uh, and what's the word? Wheel. wheel. Yeah. And you know, some people still say wheel. They have that, you know, voiceless uh, W there uh, as a remnant of the of the huh, wheel. So wheel is one of the one of the um, present day English reflexes. But there are a lot of others um, like cycle, cyclone, color. Um, culture, but they have more complicated histories then. This one is um, a nice one. Leb, what do we get, get from that? O remains the same, and B under Grimm's law becomes P. So we've got O and P, and what are we going to fill in for the vowel then? Lip. Lip. Okay. Merg meaning boundary and m remained the same. Er remained the same, but g underwent Grimm's law and became k. So what's the word? Mark. 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 Yes. Pleus meaning feather animal coat. And O remains the same, but what does B become? <laughs> so what might be the fleece? Fleece. So there's the S. S has been retained. Pleos became fleece. Um, the Indo-European root pulo meant red. Rot or decay, and um, all has remained. Uh, became. So what's the what's the word? Foul. Something foul. Exactly. Yeah. 
foul, rotting, nasty thing, foul thing, comes directly from Indo-European rot. Poor. The next one is poor, which means a uh, flame, and um, er didn't change, but p did. So how do you fill in that? Fire. Fire. And of course, you know, we have the long words like pyrotechnics and pyromaniac and, and so on, where we uh, have borrowed a, uh, from a language that kept the Indo-European, a non-Germanic Indo-European language, which uh, uh, didn't undergo Grimm's law. So, railg, uh, vomit, belch, and smoke, we need to look at what happened to g, because that's the one that is affected by Grimm's law, this one isn't. So, er, uh, what, what did g become? Oh, what's the word? Vomit, belch, smoke. Reek. Reek. Is that fascinating? Yeah. Oh, it's similar. It's similar in German too. Like it's like Rich. And Rauchen, and like to smoke. Yeah. Yeah. It comes from that. That too. Um, except that German may have undergone then, in some words, other changes. Then we have swad, which means pleasant. And of course, this doesn't undergo uh, here uh, a change. Um, the glide doesn't either, but this one we need to see what d became. D became t. So what's the word? Isn't there some kind of a game show, an old game show, where there's a woman standing in front and giving cheese no on the, what are you going to be filling in, yeah. which letter are you giving, so yeah, I all of a sudden started feeling like that. <laughs> you are giving me the answers. Okay, the next one is swad, which in Indo-European meant, oh, we did that. So, uh, swad in Indo-European meant exude. Um, and here we are looking at not s and o, because Grimm's law doesn't concern that, but we're looking at what happened to d, to know it became t. So what is that word? Sweat. Sweat. It's an old word, going back uh, all the way to Indo-European. And the last one is, uh, meaning, the meaning is join, yog or however they pronounced it in Indo-European. And here we are uh, not interested in what happened to the glide. Yeah, it remained the same. Um, oh, that's helpful to know that it remained the same. But then G became. Mm -hmm. And what's the word? Still in the vowels. Yeah. Yoke. Yolk. Yolk. Okay. Yolk, yes. Okay. Like to yoke something uh, together. Like to yoke. Like, 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 yeah. like you join to to oxen. Yeah. Yeah. With yeah. Yes. Yolk. Very well, old word. We don't. Yeah. We don't really use it anymore. No. <laughs> it's it's. I, no, yeah, it's, it's, from, a, it's from a, a word, I mean, like, this is how words go out of use if there is no need for, you know, like doing plowing with two, two oxen <laughs> anymore. I thought they were yolk, but I was like, that's eggs, and then I just didn't yeah. see it. So the meaning <laughs> has changed. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah that we can see these mechanical changes. And we can, we can see, wow, these words are really old words. They go back all the way to Indo-European, and actually very little, mostly. The vowels have changed in addition to what has changed under Grimm's law, which was the mechanical change. 
Okay, the next one uh, requires a little bit of thinking on your part. If we know that the word grain, uh, if, no, if we know that grain in, in, in the European was grano, why are we certain that grain is a borrowed word and not a native word? Yeah, because. Uh, so in the European, grano, grano is uh, like indicating that uh, you could then have the word continue. So we know that grain cannot come from this because uh, because. Uh, G would have become G. So what is the word that we have today? And that kernel? K. We keep K. We just write it with a C in English. And we keep R. And we keep N. And then later on, uh, grain was then borrowed um, after Grimm's law was no longer affecting uh, in the European. OK, uh, the number three, given that the Latin loans stolid and stands are cognate with the uh, native English still and stand respectively, why did Grimm's law not apply to the second consonant t? Because under Grimm's law would have become so why don't we have still and stand no this is there are certain exceptions to uh, Grimm's law if for instance an S became in front of it then the T was not affected So it's it sometimes was affected by you know the sound environment. So the Indo-European stops were not affected by Grimm's law after uh, if they were preceded by an S. And then uh, the next uh, exercise applying both Grimm's law and Werner's law. So uh, this becomes a little bit more complicated, but uh, that's why the. Um, the exercise should be helpful. So uh, this is Grimm's law and then Vernon's law, which was added to explain some apparent exceptions to Grimm's law. Uh, t, k, and s. Um, under Grimm's law, eventually became what? Of course, p, t, k under Grimm's law were supposed to become f, f, but uh, sometimes they didn't, and we have the um, example pater becoming in uh, English pater in Old English. Uh, and not bad fair, right? So this is explained by by um, Werner's law. So p um, became what? P, yes, they became voiced, and p became like here. And Werner's law, it really applies in the middle of the word because it has to do with the sound environment. That there is a voiceless sound before and voiceless sound after. Uh, voiced sound before and voiced sound after. Um, so p, t, k, and s are, of course, voiceless sounds. 
so um, so they became voice. So g k became g, and then this is kind of like a tag along here. Uh, it became became er in these medial word medial positions in the middle of the of the word and in when there was a voice sound before and voice sound after. Like typically vowels on both sides, okay? Like here, t is expected to become under grim, but it didn't because it was in a voiced environment. And then there was this Indo-European, um, from Indo-European to Germanic, the stress shift to the first uh, uh, root syllable. And that was the second condition for this. Difficult to see, but uh, good for Werner, smart guy, he figured it out. So uh, we're going to skip the tear apart because that's uh, kind of, uh, we'll come back to that. But let's do DMT first. So we've got the, the origin and race and here, uh, of course, we have to apply both laws, both Grimm's law and Werner's law. So this is not in the middle of the word, so G became, under Grimm's law, it became what? Yes, and N would remain the same, but then uh, if you look at the position of the Indo-European T, uh, the stress was towards the end of the word. Um, it's between n and e. And both of these sounds are voiced or voiceless. Voiced sounds. So we've got that condition uh, for Werner's law to explain why t did not become as it was supposed to under Grimm's law. So it became so what's the word? Kind. Mm -hmm. Kind. Origin, race, the same kind. Um, let's do a minty. I want to do the ones that are like um, very mechanical. Uh, m is not affected either by Grimm or Werner. M is a nasal that doesn't change, but the n here, it provides a sound environment for the t, which is supposed to become, lose its vo uh, become a voiceless fricative, and um, yet it didn't happen, because this is in a voiced environment, so assimilation, voicing assimilation, that this becomes its voiced counterpart. So, mind, right? mind, think, makes sense. Uh, let's do rope. Uh, R is not affected by Grimm or Werner. We don't know what's going to happen to the vowels, but we do know what's going to happen to P because this is this indicates that the word continues, and here we have a voiced sound, a vowel, and this most likely was a voiced sound, also meaning snatch. And under Werner, this word medial p became b. So, what's the word? Wrong. Wrong. Rob to snatch. And uh, finally, we get to apply the x becoming er. Mentioned last time, we have the was and where variation, which is explained by Werner for this became er. Of course, these are voiceless sounds, all these four, and these are all voiced sound sounds. So this is 
one of those phonological processes of voicing assimilation becomes the same as surrounding sounds. This is a difficult one because we don't really use this word very much. Um, anyone? Don't feel bad if you didn't know this is sear, um, something that is kind of like, you know, like it flowers go old and they become sear, dry. All right, now let's go back to globe, <laughs> tear apart. So, um, Grimm's law affected that one, it would have become, mm, but then other things happened as well. Um, oh, it remains the same. This initial g becomes g. And I'm going to write it with a c because that's how we write it in English. Uh, don't know what happens to the vowels, and then that's why I didn't want to do this first, uh, because this eventually it became a b, but so it's cleave, cleave, tear apart, um, but this is a more complicated thing that shouldn't have started with that one in this exercise, and the same thing, let's look at kaput, which we skipped, because sometimes things are not as mechanical as we would like them to be. We're talking about language. Kaput meaning head. Oh, it's already done. So, so it became head. And uh, what is explained, uh, what explains the k becoming h? Grim or Werner? Grim. And then sometimes you do a phonological process of uh, deletion <laughs> and just skip some sounds. And then this t became the uh, Grim or Werner. Grim or Werner. Werner, yes, and note that this uh, this indicates, this little line indicates that it was a word medial position. So these sounds would have been voiced. And that's why uh, t became voice, voiced, the voices became voiced. So Werner's law is basically a voicing assimilation process and you have been extremely patient and now you know Grimm and Werner. Yes. Can you ever why in uh, the first one the, the VH turns into a V sound? The is, is that just the voicing rule? The cleave. Yes, the cleave. Because I thought of the club at first. Yeah. Yeah, good guess. Um, the the b mm -hmm. eventually becoming v. Yeah, in Old English it was Cleo, Van, it was already a V in, in Old English. Now, it's homo-organic uh, with, with uh, B. So, of course, uh, under Grimm, the B is supposed to become B. Mm -hmm. So your guess was really good. And you can actually go, go to uh, check in Oxford English Dictionary and see if that comes from this same. I'm not going to say anything because I might be lying. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, have a good rest of the week and uh, do well in the test. And I'll, I'll post it on midnight on Thursday. And so it's going to be open 24 hours for you. All right. Test or assignment, whatever you want to call it. Bye.